Hello, this is Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt, your host today, and I'm here with William Nibel, Bill Nibel, usually, um, an attorney who works for tenants. So, Bill Nibel, you are an attorney, uh, but say a little more about whom you represent and where you work. Sure, happy to do so. Thanks for this opportunity, nice to be with you. So I'm an attorney for low income tenants. I work for Legal Services of Central New York out of the Binghamton office. I'm also a pro bono volunteer with the Ithaca Tenants Union Housing Hotline, supervising law students there. So you're in essence, I guess, located in Binghamton, but partly working in Ithaca. And of That's course, right. everybody is remote these days. <laughs> so right. what else is new? <laughs> um, now, I will try to sort of ask this from a tenant's point of view. When someone considers renting an apartment or a room or a house, they consider what the monthly rent will be. But often, in addition, they have to put in a very substantial security deposit, damage deposit. And certainly in Ithaca, these can mean a lot of money. But what should a potential renter look out for in this? Yeah, good question. In the past, I know it's been that sometimes a landlord would require two or three months uh, of monthly rent, in essence, as a security deposit. Uh, fortunately, last year, the Tenant Protection Act was signed into law, and that set up some very good rules and procedures with respect to security deposit. So a security deposit now, or any kind of advance that's paid to the landlord before moving in, cannot be more than one month's rent. And there's additional protections under the security deposit law now. For example, it's a much quicker uh, streamlined process for getting the security deposit back after the tenant moves out within a matter of weeks, whereas in the past it may have taken months. Uh, additionally, there's a, there's a provision now that if the tenant requests it after signing the lease, but before they move in, they can actually do an inspection of the place they're going to rent and see any pre-existing damage that might be there. So that can be documented and it doesn't get billed to them uh, later out of their security deposit. Oh, these all sound like things that have been, we keep kept hearing about as issues in the past. Um, now, some tenants sign a lease for a year. Others rent month, <clears throat> month to month, or I guess that means they actually don't have a lease. Uh, is it better one way or the other? Well, it really depends on what you're looking for. So the lease, usually for a year, but of course a lease can be for less than a year, maybe six months, or it could be for more than a year. But a written lease uh, provides some security. And what I mean is the tenant knows they can live there for that long, as long as they comply and pay the rent. They also know that the rent is set in stone for that term of the lease, it can't be raised. Uh, but then again, you're locked in, so to speak, for that term. So if you want more flexibility, sometimes it is wise to have the, the month to month arrangement if a landlord is willing to do that or, or just a shorter term lease. And you're right, usually if someone's month to month, they don't have a written lease. Sometimes they do though. There are actually monthly rental agreements out there. And again, the downside being then that either the landlord or the tenant can terminate it on relatively short notice, on a month or so notice, and, uh, and that's that. Of course, rent could also be raised on shorter notice. So, right, advantages, disadvantages, both depending on needs. And of course, actually in, in Ithaca, that, that year-long lease for many people is a problem when they only want to live 10 months. <laughs> I believe, it. yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. I have to take responsibility for the extra two at the end. Right. Uh, 
Now, once you're in an apartment, you've signed the lease, you're in the, depart the apartment, can the landlord just come in at any time? Well, the answer is no, with one big exception. So I say no because the general understanding in the law is that a landlord has to give reasonable notice to come in at a reasonable time. So what that usually means is notice of at least 24 hours has to be given to the tenant. Of course, the landlord really should try to get an agreement from the tenant that this is a good time, that this day will work, and if not, you know, cooperate on selecting another day. And then the landlord should be coming in at a reasonable time, which usually that's nine to five, sort of ordinary business hours. But of course, if the landlord knew, for example, that the tenant works nights, then the landlord wouldn't necessarily be reasonable saying they're going to come in at nine or 10 in the morning. Maybe it should be later in the afternoon or the evening. And then the big exception I mentioned when a landlord could just come in at any time is in a true emergency. So the classic example is a pipe burst, and there's going to be some real damage if the landlord doesn't just get right in there. Right, and gee, I've I've called landlords from the street a couple. Hey, do you know there's water streaming from this place? It's happened more than once. That wow, yeah, it sounds it, like a real emergency. Well, I I walk a lot, so I you know I see things that you wouldn't see driving by. Now, on the other hand, suppose the tenant is perfectly willing, you know, and able to let the landlord in, but the landlord refuses to come around to fix problems. I mean, again, let's say we said leaks. Let's say there's a leak from the bathtub on the floor above and it's coming through the ceiling and the tenant has informed the landlord and the landlord just sort of is unresponsive or puts yeah. it off and off and off. Yeah, that, that does happen. Of course, that can happen. And there are a few options. Uh, one is if it's something that's potentially a code violation, something that's really uh, affecting the livability of the place, we call it habitability in the law, uh, that could be reported to the local code enforcement agency. And the good thing there is the code enforcement agency has some authority to inspect and then order the landlord to correct the problem within a certain amount of time or face penalties, face sanctions. Uh, another thing the tenant could do, uh, either in addition to contacting code enforcement or instead, would be to put a written demand in, so a written request to the landlord to fix it by a certain deadline, sort of documenting the attempt to work it out. And then if it's something that the tenant could actually pay for, so out of, for example, the next month's rent, they could do what's called repair and deduct, in other words. Now, there's some potential uh, risk to this, but if it were less than one month's rent and the tenant could actually pay to get the problem corrected and they gave the landlord the opportunity to fix it first, well, then they can deduct from the next month's rent, tell the landlord, here's why I'm only paying you a portion because it costs the other amount to get the work done. I say there's some risk because the landlord could absolutely you know, refuse to accept that and just say, no, you still owe me rent. And I'm going to try to take you to court for that. But having the written documentation uh, would provide the tenant with some protection in the event that happened. Uh, yes, where have I heard this kind of thing before? I think in, uh, in workplace problems, keep your records, keep your records. Yeah, document, document, document. Now, another kind of the opposite problem, you might say, the other problem, the tenant let's say, doesn't get their paycheck on time. They're paid late. Now that's a different kind of violation. That's the one I'm more familiar with from uh, workplace issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, in some cases, there they are. They just don't have the money to pay the rent even though their salary should have been, or wages, whatever, should have been coming in regularly, but it isn't. Um, can't, so what can the landlord do in the way of penalties for late rent? So it's another thing that was made clear under the Tenant Protection Act that a landlord, if they don't receive the rent within five days of the due date, they can potentially charge a late fee, but it's limited to either 5% of the monthly rent or $50, whichever is less. 
And that would have to be in a lease, too. There really can only be a late fee charged if there's a lease mm -hmm. providing for it. Uh, of course, other penalties we'll probably talk more about, but there's the risk of eviction, right, if a person can't pay their rent. Okay, but hopefully there may be other things that people can do before it comes to even the risk of eviction. I, yeah. I know in Ithaca there are some programs that actually aim at preventing eviction. Um, yeah, so usually folks, if they're behind in rent, they could uh, seek assistance from County Department of Social Services. Uh, sometimes there's ongoing rent assistance available there, or there can just be one-time emergency assistance available. Uh, there's also like the Community Action Agency, I think it's Tompkins Community Action, or, yes. Cat or Catholic Charities, something like that. I've heard of Catholic Charities, certainly. And I guess in, in Tompkins, Ithaca and Tompkins County, a good rule of thumb is if you're wondering what agency or you're not sure how to reach them, call 211. The number 211 is a general referral service for everything. You know, they're the ones who have the files on every sort of help that you might be able to get. Yeah, very good suggestion, yeah. So, yeah, so I guess, again, once again, prevention is the first step. But then maybe it just doesn't work or somehow the tenant is in some odd situation where they don't fit any of the criteria for getting help for whatever reason. Um, and so the landlord concludes they're going to evict. How does the tenant find out that this is happening? So, of course, sometimes a landlord will just say, I'm going to evict you. I'm threatening the tenant that they're going to evict. That doesn't mean much. Uh, it really becomes something serious and meaningful when there's a written notice. So whether it's a 14-day notice under the Tenant Protection Act to pay rent or move out, or whether it's some other termination notice for a, a lease violation, or just a general 30, 60, or 90 day notice, which wouldn't necessarily have to have a reason. It's just the landlord saying, I don't want to rent to you anymore. So there would be a written notice. That's the point of some kind of violation or some kind of warning that an eviction could be coming. And just to mention, when that 14 day notice says, pay the rent within 14 days or move out, you don't really have to move out within the 14 days. That's really just setting the stage for the landlord to be able to go to court and pursue eviction there. Uh, ah, I see. So you get the notice, but in fact, the eviction proceeding isn't starting as of the notice. The eviction proceeding itself only starts later. Yeah, only and that's important because landlords yeah. cannot evict without using the court process. So that's the point. Just some notice from a landlord does not actually affect your tenancy and make you move out or get the sheriff involved or anything. There always has to be court involvement before an actual eviction. Mm -hmm. And again, what should the tenant do if they do get, well, either the 14 day notice or the eviction notice? I mean, that's the time to be seeking an attorney. So if you are in a position where you're low income, don't feel you can afford an attorney, uh, you want to reach out to one of the legal aid or legal services programs like Legal Assistance of Western New York. Uh, if you're in Tompkins County there, uh, there may be a attorney referral service through the local bar association too, if, if you're someone who might be able to afford an attorney. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. that's right. Tompkins County Legal Assistance of Western New York, Law New York. Um, I'm actually going to ask now the questions, but suppose you're in Schuyler County, because our radio program broadcasts to Schuyler as well as Tompkins. Sure. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if that's still within legal assistance of Western New York. I think it is. Um, but, but probably the 211 resource that you mentioned earlier would be a good place to start there. Yeah. 
Okay, well, maybe before this actually goes to radio, we can figure this out. Okay. Um, so, okay, but supposing, supposedly it does, you know, you have reached out to a lawyer, but how can the lawyer help? So eviction is a very technical, very technical area of the law. So it's something where, you know, you really need to talk to an attorney to know your rights at that point. Uh, some things, if you don't request them up front or you don't request them uh, at the time you appear in front of the judge, you'll lose those rights. So there's a right to an adjournment or a postponement of the eviction hearing. There's a right to a jury trial, if you want one as an example. But, but there are many other rights and defenses that a, that a tenant's attorney could raise to either prevent the eviction entirely or slow it down and buy some time. Okay, so yeah, I noticed you, you had sent me a, a PowerPoint and that it talked a lot about different scenarios. Uh, maybe maybe you should say a little bit about more about scenarios. Yeah, so as I alluded to earlier, there are a number of different kinds of eviction notices, 14-day, 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, uh, objectionable tenancy, lease violation notices. And then there are two main categories of eviction, non-payment and holdover. So depending on which notice you receive, the landlord needs to file a certain kind of eviction after that, needs to wait a certain amount of time to file that eviction. So there's a number of different variables uh, that it would be good to have an attorney review yeah. and see if they were done right. Yeah. Well, non-payment, I just take it that is the kind of situation we I was asking about before you the tenant doesn't have the money or the tenant doesn't know when the money will come in or something like that if the money is late or for some reason not non-existent but what is holdover what does that mean yeah. so so a holdover means somebody is living there after the landlord says they've terminated the tenancy They've terminated the lease. They've terminated the person's right to be there, supposedly. And that's by giving a 30-day notice. Uh, if a person does not have a lease and they've lived there less than a year, or it might be a 60 or a 90-day notice if a tenant has lived there longer. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the, the person is supposedly holding over uh, mm -hmm. after the term of their tenancy. And they have to go to court. The landlord has to go to court to prove that and get what's called a warrant of eviction to actually put that holdover person out. I see. And I guess that holdover could have started with a whole bunch of different reasons, whether it, not just, not, it could also have been a non-payment, presumably, but it could also have been something the tenant did. Yeah, and I mean, just as an example, we talked about month-to-month -month tenancies. Month-to-month -month tenancies can just be terminated at any time uh, for no reason. So the landlord may just want to stop renting the place or wants to raise the rent and the tenant doesn't want to agree to that. And the landlord then wants to rent to somebody else. So those are things that can bring about a holdover, even without a big lease violation. If I could just mention what you, you brought up about the non-payment evictions. So there's even more rights, again, for a tenant under the Tenant Protection Act that even if they're not able to pay within those 14 days, when they get that 14 day notice, even if they get eviction papers that have been filed with a court served on them, they're still able to pay and stay. They still have the right to pay and stay. It's not too late. Even if they go to the hearing in front of the judge and they're able to pay what they owe, they still get to pay and stay. It's not at that point too late and the landlord can say, I don't want their money anymore. I just want to evict them. That's not, that's not the case. Okay, so the, there are there's some flexibility there if if the money is going to come along right. at some point. But um, then again, there are certain tenants who have particularly difficult problems in their lives. Uh, and I understand the law can be of help, but maybe you could go into some of those types of situations. Types. Sure. So a couple of situations that come to mind are a person with a disability who, for example, 
needs to have an emotional support animal or a service animal. And perhaps the landlord has a no pets general policy. Well, the, the tenant is entitled to request a reasonable accommodation. So in other words, an exception to that policy, if they have generally something from a medical provider saying they need this. So that's a good example where the, the law can help that person and you know prevent them from being evicted for violating the pets policy. Uh, there's also individuals who are victims or survivors of domestic violence. And there are some very special protections in the law, either uh, to allow the person who's the victim to get out of a lease, to get out of a dangerous situation mm -hmm. in the middle of a lease, or protection from being evicted for being a victim. You know, if, if the landlord just says, I want these people out because they're problems, you know, the victim has protection from being evicted. Sounds good. I guess other cases I understand might involve mental illness or. Yeah, and those may uh, similarly bring into play the uh, Americans with Disability Act, as we hear ADA, uh -huh. or the related, what's called the Fair Housing Amendments Act. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, there's disability issues. It, it also can just mean uh, special time and attention given to that person. Now, a lot of things changed recently, what with COVID-19, because sudden, like, for instance, suddenly all sorts of people who had steady incomes suddenly, poof, didn't have the income anymore. Or I guess changes in, well, let's go, let's go at that one and then maybe separately talk about some other things that the situation might have brought about. Sure. Well, partly because of that, that reality of people losing incomes, the governor enacted what people call a moratorium on all evictions. So all evictions are suspended for three months uh, at least. So it was right up until June 20th initially, that's the three months. But then he later extended it another two months or so to August 20th. Now, there's some technical confusion on whether that applies to all evictions or just non-payment ones where the person is struggling because of their loss of income. But in that case, someone who's struggling because they lost income due to the pandemic or, be, or they're getting unemployment benefits, well, then that moratorium, that prevention of eviction is all the way up until August 20th and maybe beyond. I understand the legis legislature is considering some things. Okay, so what, yeah, what I first heard was that the extension didn't really help very much, but I think you said it was strengthened. Yeah, so locally, locally, even though we're just past June 20th now, locally, the suspension of all evictions is, for all practical purposes, it's, it's still in effect. So the courts are not hearing any evictions in our judicial district. Uh, the courts are not allowing evictions to proceed at this point. Uh, we may get further clarification in July, but it is clear that those non-payment evictions where a person is struggling financially because of COVID, because of the pandemic, those are on hold until at least August 20th. Okay, have there been other uh, complications due to COVID-19? I mean- Sure. I'm hearing of people whose living situations changed in all sorts of crazy ways. It, it happens that what I hear most of all is like from, you know, homeowner down the street and suddenly all three kids are back. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of one thing that I've heard a couple of times in my practice, and that's the landlord wanting to come into the apartment, as we talked about earlier. Oh, uh, yes even with proper notice, but just wanting to come in for a routine inspection or routine maintenance. And the tenant understandably saying, you know, I don't want that because I don't want to be potentially exposed uh, to the pandemic, to the virus at this point. And so we've just reasoned on it generally that just like everything else, only essential activities should still be happening. So it should really only be essential stuff that a landlord needs to take care of almost like an emergency like we said it should a landlord should not be insisting now on you know coming into the person's personal space 
just for routine maintenance. And, and then there's also been probably the opposite where the tenant wants the maintenance and can't get it. That's true. Or land, That's true. Have, have some landlords said that they're afraid to go in. That's true. I have heard that one too. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been limited what code enforcement will get involved on because they only want to be going out to places and inspecting when it's a real emergency or really essential thing too. So yeah. Oh, so it 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 COVID nineteen has complicated things in multiple ways, and yeah. probably will continue to do so for quite a while. And of course, Ithaca is trying to get um, emergency powers to cancel rents. But I read about that. Yeah. yeah um, Hadn't, I haven't actually, I haven't heard that the, that the State Department of Health has actually done anything. I haven't heard that either. I just heard yeah. that the proposal that it was sent up to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and people from here were phoning the state. I understand. But I sus well, we, we shall see. By the time this airs, things may have been resolved. So we shouldn't, probably not worth going into this a lot. So, uh, Bill Nibel, uh, anything to add? Or I could mention the ways to get in touch with the tenant rights, um, the tenant, Ithaca Tenants Union. I would just add that I, I did use this wonderful resource called Google, and it looks like Skylar is covered by Legal Assistance of Western New York. Good. So they're the same same outfit. Good. Yeah. So another, I guess, entry place in any case that might lead, you know, to to your services or somebody assisted by by you is the Ithaca Tenants Union, and I think it is not just limited to the city of Ithaca. They're, you know, they'll take people from certainly around the county. Um, they have a hotline. 607-301-1560. And I think at this point we have run out of time. Thank you, Bill Nibel. Nice to be with you, thank you. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Ault.